here we go. Now, this is the calendar of the Pacific year that Passover fell on the Exodus. The Passover was on a Tuesday this particular year. The following year was a Wednesday. In, in 2018, when I was had the privilege of sharing 11 campsites in Oregon, we were on the same calendar that Moses and the crew were on when they left when they left Egypt on a Tuesday. Now, right now, the count, the, the Omer count right now is on day 20. So we're way past this calendar into the next month. But let's just pretend just tonight that we're on the Tuesday Passover, and, and that way it'll flow, flow a lot easier for me when I speak. The introduction to Campsite 1 could be talked about for hours and explained in so many ways. As we take a peek and look inside, we will follow the camp on a Tuesday Passover year, like in 2018. This is just a short sketch that Abba gave me in 2018. It was just wonderful sharing the first 11 campsites at the Oregon Feast. So let's pretend this year's count is on a Tuesday Passover, and we will see the calendar for that year's cycle. It's so righteous counting the Elmer like we are right now for me this year, and I know it will be for you too. So let's just ponder on the things that we're going to speak about. And remember, take note, take note, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 13. You can read the whole chapter in this context, but 1 through 13 is talking about the campsites, and we will read that here shortly. We are in last day application of the wheel and the wheel and the wheel. Look wisely and dig for the buried fruit. That's our instructions, folks, for end game. He's coming again. He is coming again. <clears throat> During the weeks of the Omer count, we will retrack the ancient Israelites' journey from campsite 1 up to 11, the desert of Sinai, where Moses receives the covenant words and the people agreed. Let's glean and learn the lessons the people faced, for they are the same necessity for us today. They're great object lessons. Elohim had a promise of rest, refuge, and redemption, but not without reproof in the rules. He provided them with everything they needed, but they still complained and rebelled. Each time Elohim moved them onward, there were new trials and tests. Even though he provided multiple miracles of provision for them, most would not believe, trust, or even be thankful. Because of this, he could only bring a remnant into his promised land. And then they still lived in anticipation of Elohim's next step of redemption. The Torah and the prophets told them to expect a Melech, a king, to come as a Shadik, righteous Messiah, who would restore the original covenant promises to his people. Yahushua came unto his own, but they rejected him. Only a remnant followed and obeyed. I'm going to repeat that. Only a remnant followed and obeyed, and only the remnant received his gift, the Ruach HaKadosh. On that same day, on that same day of Shavuot, when the covenant was blood ratified in the wilderness. Upon the roots of that covenant, the Ruach, gift of empowerment from Yahusha, would cause believers to have intercession directly to the Father Yah Yahuwah, Thus, to be able to operate more fully in relationship and righteousness. The Ruach makes us even more capable to align to the rules of the road to the heavenly kingdom. Unto whom much is given, much is also required for us to bear much fruit of righteousness. In this journey, let us allow the Ruach to help us learn the lessons that challenged our forefathers, those of trust, submission, and reliance, as we face trials and tribulations on our journey to the promised place Yahusha has prepared for us. And may we always praise Elohim in thanksgiving on our way. Various CC members will be leading us through these campsites. If you are interested in being a part of this, Please let us know. 
while Tim and Charlene take a break from weekly responsibility for a while. However, each week they will be present to answer any related calendar questions, especially for any new members. And I just want to say welcome to anybody who's new. And I, and I pray that this isn't too heavy of a presentation for you that is given just right so that you, too, can understand. I'm seeing in my studies that the end time Israel will only go through 12 campsites. We're not going to have a golden calf experience. We're Joseph's flame people. We're going to rock for Yosha. So be warned. This is a rehearsal for the real soon coming deal on our watch. The 42 campsites are very important to study and there's great object lessons in them. But we're not going to be doing all 42 on this Omer count, I guarantee it. Searching for timely gems of truth in this photocopy of ours in 2020 has been a great joy for me. Most students of the word skip over the 33rd chapter of Numbers, thinking it's a useless wasteland of information. Okay, there I said it. This year's count is the Exodus, and in it is light that progresses more and more to the perfect day. And in this study of short, precious gems of great importance, let's truly ponder and ask Abba to protect our minds as we study to see if these things be true. This is key, folks. In the name of the campsites... In the name of the campsites, we will see prophetic shadow pictures in which to construct a portrait of final Israel, walking from this sick and twisted world to Joseph's flame. End time saviors! Boy, I can't wait to dig into the Daniel and Revelation and follow the Messiah to the 70 weeks. Keep sticking around, folks. That's going to be our journey soon. It's not a joke. It's the real deal. The word is declaring to us what is coming. We will know the end from the beginning, folks. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Right now, the children of Israel are at Campsite 11 at the Mount for a whole year. They're getting molded for a Book of the Law temple. They're getting ready to build, remember? Because they violated at the Golden Calf. But get this. In last day application, we're at the mount right now, and we're not going to have a golden calf. And guess what? We're the temple. We are the temple. Remember, no golden calf on our watch. And as we start our walk and count with this Exodus account, we will be empowered with last day instruction to survive, to survive what is coming, because it's coming to survive and be saviors. Did you hear what I said? To be to survive and to be the saviors. Here we are molded to be sealed. There we go. I'm going to read First Corinthians ten, one through thirteen. I skipped over that. Shame on me. But this is very critical. In the New Testament, Paul tells us that we need to go to the campsites and check them out because they were given to us for endgame. Are we not an endgame? In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock, that rock was Yosha. But with many of them, Yah was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things are our examples. Now, these things are our examples. Now, these things are our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. Neither be ye adulterators, as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. 
Neither let us tempt Yahusha, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the world has come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But Yahuwah is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape, that ye shall be able to bear it. I just really encourage everybody, everybody to, to, to focus and meditate on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 13 on the Omer count. So let's look at a shadow picture. The children of Israel had not begun their stay in Egypt as slaves, remember? It just seems it ended up that way. Many of us come into bondage because of the same, the same curses. It creeps up slowly. <laughs> Easter eggs and bunny rabbits, jack-o'-lanterns, and those flesh pots. Oh, the moon! And in our day, watch out for Enoch. They found pleasing answers. They found pleasing answers there, and they stepped into a fellowship with spiritual darkness that cursed them into bondage. But their friendship with the world was their ruin. In James 4.1.4 we read, Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with Elohim? Whosoever therefore will be a, f a friend of the world is an enemy of Yah? Let us ponder on this. Are we still in Egypt? Are we still in Egypt, or are we at the Mount with Calendar Club? Let's give further consideration to know that the bondage creeps upon us. Near the place of Pharaoh, near the place of, excuse me, near the place, near the palace of Pharaoh, Joseph's family was given the best land, the best land. They made their home on the edge of darkness in Goshen the land of many waters. Prophetically, waters often signifies of masses of people from various religions and cultures. They kept Yahweh's ways, and they knew how to count. I'm sure Jacob stuck a stick in the ground and watched it and, and marked the shadow of the equinox. They counted. They practiced their religion all the while increasing in tolerance for the nearby darkness. Let's look at the similarities. I was born in Egypt. How about you? Were you born in Egypt? The descendants of Jacob prospered and filled the land. They did. They prospered and they filled the land. Seventy souls entered into Egypt. Seventy signifies the eye or focus on Yahweh's plan. It also represents the windows of the soul. Thus, even the meaning of the numbers suggests two possible outcomes to living in this new home. Israel could either walk in harmony with Yahweh's plan or slowly drift away from him, following after the spiritual darkness of so prevalent around them. As one author puts it, but this drift from prosperity into spiritual complacency did not happen during the lifetime of Joseph. He was focused on Yahweh's plan, and he became a beacon of light in a dark and twisted Egypt. With this prophetic gift of interpreting dreams, Joseph had come to the attention of the Pharaoh, as stated in Genesis. The remaining chapters of Genesis offer a sketch of Joseph's marriage to the daughter of the priest of On in Genesis 41-45 and is going through the land on business of the Pharaoh while seeking tidings of the true Elohim and the arrival of his family to sojourn in the land. The fact that Joseph followed Yahweh's plan and shared the truth with Egypt is revealed all through Scripture. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Genesis 41.6 
blow the trumpet on the new month. In the time appointed, blow that trumpet on our solemn feast day, for this was a statute for Israel and a law of Yahweh of Jacob. This is key. He ordained this in Joseph for a testimony when he went out throughout the land of Egypt. They kept the feasts. They knew the calendar, and they kept it with all their hearts. Thus here Joseph knew how to count. He knew when the first day of the seventh month was, plus I'm sure he knew when the holy day was, the Day of Atonement, and just uh, 15 days later from trumpets was, was, was tabernacles. It was a testimony in Joseph. He learned it from his daddy Jacob. It wasn't until the political climate changed after the dream of Joseph and the rise of a new pharaoh that the descendants of Jacob found their environment oppressive. Even that oppression advanced slowly, just like a frog in a pot. You know, when the frog goes to sleep and that's all she wrote? Now I'm sure we can all see the similarities. That, that's what's going on then. Well, what's going on now today? Today on our watch, Elijah Tame, do you see the similarities? Do you see what we're getting ready for? Because we have inherited the sin nature, our hearts are just dark, and we need the atonement of Abba's son to give us the power to leave Egypt and never, huh, never look back. When they left out on unleavened bread on the 15th day of the first month, they left their life there, everything. Little did they know that the wicked heart, the wicked heart, oh, that wicked heart, would be trying to convince the soul that we need to go back to Egypt. We had lots of food, and we had water. Oh, we had our flesh pots and our idols, and I bet some of them, some of them were playing with the moon. And all along, Abba was testing, refining, and trying to lead them into the Canaan land. But no, they blew it there. And now there's going to be a workforce. And we're going to swim in blood for many years to come. The poor Israelite slaves needed evidence that the Elohim of their fathers, that the Elohim of their, fa their fathers were more powerful than the false gods that they were encountered at, during their exile. Those wizards were constantly bombarding them with all their garbage, just like today, with all the things that go on on my side of the fence. Just read the news and take a look. <clears throat> the years of taskmasters task and affliction and the burdens prepared the Israelites to hope more and more in their father's testimonies. Those fathers knew. They knew the words of Abraham because it was handed down from Jacob, from Joseph, and they held it dear to their hearts. They were handed down to them since the time of Adam. The elders knew. This is a huge study in its own right, folks. What did Adam teach for 900 years? Ponder on that. I have always wondered why the children of Israel were, were left in bondage for so long. And then I kind of remembered that Moses tried to uh, deliver them on his own 40 years earlier, but the Israelites had become so accustomed to bondage and so comfortable in their service to Egypt <clears throat> that they just told Moses um, the words of the slaves to Moses, who made you a priest and a judge over us? Exodus 2.14. Okay, connect this laser vision thought. Track with me. Moses left, and he was trained by Abba in the same terrain, the very same terrain that he would be bringing the redeemed host to. For 40 years, he would be trained. Now, he, now he's coming back, and yet here's another huge gem for, from the Spirit to behold. He meets his brother, he meets his own brother in the real flesh to team up with Yahweh and became and become a flame in the land. Let my people go. The connection of the power of being one in royal covenant and knowing that that we will shout, Hero Israel. Hero Israel, the Lord thy God is one. 
no golden calf on our watch. We are overcomers. In the book of Revelation, it says, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. Overcomes what? Egypt. That's what. In the first campsite, we will, be, we will begin our journey, and we will discover the Spirit's leading, and praise Abba for the light, as it, as it now grows more and more to that perfect day. <clears throat> We're almost there, folks. But first, we're all going to get tested. Short review of the introduction. Ancient Israel experiences tests and lessons that are a prophetic connection with other witnesses in Yah's word. Obadiah. I love the book of Obadiah. The books of Daniel. The books of Revelation. You've got to have Daniel with Revelation, folks, or you just can't see the photocopy correctly. Ezekiel, the Revelation. All sum it up. Connect the wheels, the shadow pictures for the bride, blood-tipped ears, today if you will hear his voice. And seeing this end game journey before it happens in this sick and twisted earth, just like Moses and Aaron. There are 42 campsites listed, and, and, and how many do you think there would have been if the violation of the golden calf didn't happen? Just ponder on that for a second. If they did not have the golden calf, do you think the number 12 would be significant? Boom, in the land. But no, they're going to fry out in the desert for 40 more years and get disciplined. It's just something to ponder. But most of all, trusting Abba to guide and direct while we sit under our teacher's tables and grab the crumbs that fall on our plates as we eat it, it becomes a feast of investigation in our own hearts, and we behold it, and we share it with one another. Joseph knew how to count in review. Jacob, I believe, knew how to put a stick in the ground and mark that day called the Kufa. He saw that that shadow does not turn, just like James tells us in James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from Abba, the Abba of lights, with whom there is no variableation, neither shadow of turning. Equinox, not equilux. And remember in Psalms what it says, that if it, it, it was a testimony in Jacob and it was handed down to Joseph, they knew when the tenth day was, and they knew when the day of atonement was, and they knew when tabernacles was. They counted and it's being restored in us. Now we're on our way to go see Pharaoh. Okay, in review, the children of Israel have, have <clears throat> had their Passover. I will not be talking about the Passover or the plagues in this presentation, just because of the time that's, that's needed. And I just want to remind you that their count was on a Tuesday, and they left on the 15th. They had three days to journey to hold a feast. They, they told Pharaoh, I think it was seven times, let us go, man. We need to keep a feast under, under Yahuwah, and we need three days. Well, little did Pharaoh know that they were going to be crossing the Gulf of Aqaba. <laughs> so here we are, folks. Okay. The children of Israel are, are, are leaving <laughs> with, with um, 11... Unleavened bread cakes underneath their um, their clothing, and they're being bursted out into the land. And there's a memorial that I want to read in Exodus 13 and and 14. Exodus 13, 14 through 22. That's a reminder for history on this particular day. And it says, "And it shall be when thy son asks thee in time to come." in the future, saying, What is this? What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand, Yahweh brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Yahweh slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahuwah all that openeth up the matrix, 
being males, but all the firstborn of my children are redeemed. Now get this. This is really important. This is the sign that's in our forehead, folks. This is our ceiling. While the world receives their mark, unleavened bread is huge. And it shall be a token upon thy hand and for a frontals between thy eyes, a memorial for by strength of hand, Yahweh brought us out from Egypt. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that Yahweh led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For Yahweh said, let us preadventure the people repent when they see war and they return. But Yahweh led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Now here's a picture from way up in the atmosphere looking down at the, um, <clears throat> at the, um, at the Red Sea. And you can see up here where the little red circle is. That's Ramses. This is where the children of Israel were. And this is their walk to Sukkot. But I think this red line should be a little longer because they actually walked 27 miles, folks, their first night. Their first night. And Moses also took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightway sworn to the children of Israel, saying, Yah will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And Yahweh went up before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and to go by night. He took them, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. So with a mighty right fist, a mighty right hand, Yahweh led the children of Israel, the cloud during the day, and a fire by night. Campsite one is the meaning of Sukkot. It means temporary shelter or boost. It means temporary shelter or boost, a transition from some slaves to becoming one in Abba. In the Egyptian lingo, it stood for the place of transition. It was a temporary shelter, coming out of darkness into the dawn, into the light, because it progresses more and more to that perfect day. We are receiving that light on this year's cycle. <clears throat> As we begin in the first wheel with Moses at the base of the mount, beholding a bush on fire, he gets his marching orders. And this is where Moses talks with Yahweh and gets his marching orders. And he's going to be talking to the elders of the camp, those who know the statutes of Jacob and the testimony of Joseph. Remember? That law that was still in the elders' minds, and they knew, and Moses and his brother Aaron were told to tell them, the God of your fathers has sent us to you. Okay, Mark, you want to read um, Exodus chapter uh, 3, please? So this scene here is Moses at the burning bush. Chapter 3, verse 1. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Yahuwah. Then the angel of Yahuwah appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moshe looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. So Moshe thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When Yahuwah saw that he had gone over to look, Yahuwah called out to him from the bush, Moshe, Moshe, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the Yahuwah of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob. His face because he was afraid to look at Yahuwah. Then Yahuwah said, 
I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors, and I know about their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land, from that land, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. The Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moshe asked Yahuwah, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He answered, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship Yahuwah at this mountain. Then Moshe asked Yahuwah, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? Yahuwah replied to Moshe, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Elohim also said to Moses, Say this to the Israelites, Yahuwah, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, Yahuwah, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said, I have paid close attention to you, to what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised you that I will bring you up from the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to what you say. Then you, along with the elders of Israel, must go to the king of Egypt and say to him, Yahuwah the Elohim of the Hebrews has met with us. Now put, let us go on a three-day trip to the wilderness, so we may sacrifice to Yahuwah our Elohim. However, I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go unless he is forced by a strong hand. I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give these people such favor in the sight of the Egyptians that when you go, you will not be empty-handed. Each woman will ask her neighbor and any woman staying in her house for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters so you will plunder the Egyptians. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome, brother. Just picture this scene, you guys. Now, here's Moses and his brother. He's, he's meeting his brother on the desert floor, and look at what Exodus 4, 24 through 27 says. And it came to pass by the way of the end that Yah met him and sought to kill him. Kill Moses. Then Zephora took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it to his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. And look at the next verse. And Yah said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the Mount of Yah. Where? Mount Sinai, folks. They're at the very same place. And he kissed him. And I just thought this was really remarkable. When I saw this, I said, Wait a second. If Moses had died... Who would have picked up the ball and taken it to Pharaoh? Think about that for a minute, because the statute states that when a husband dies of the royal order, that the brother can pick up the ball and remarry the wife so she can keep the family name. Think about that for a minute. What if Aaron was the one who took the ball to, to Pharaoh? It would, everything would have changed. I just thought that was interesting, and that, that statute was there. 
we've got two brothers meeting at the mount. This is huge. And they go up in the mount, and Moses tells Aaron all that Yah has said. Ponder on that. Two brothers of the royal order, along with a wife and a newly circumcised little boy, going in to a dark and twisted Egypt to save their brothers. Bros saving bros. A family team. A family team, you guys. Are we not a family team? A family team going in and kicking Pharaoh's coon dog. And they are commanded to go to the elders. Why? Again, the elders knew. Oh, they knew. They were, they were desiring for this day to finally show. But when will it? That's why they bowed and worshipped Yahweh when they heard the report. Plus, the reason why Aaron and Moses were told why in advance that Pharaoh would not repent. So there was going to be a showdown, and Abba forewarned them so they would be humble and wait. Wow, what an object lesson to know what's really going to come down, but to have the patience to put up with Pharaoh and be humble and wait. Just like the info we get from coming in, we've got to be humble and we've got to wait. Father is building this up with faith and hope and victory because we see the applications of history. Do we not? Now, just ponder on the bros going in to set free the brethren. I think I already said that, but I get so excited I want to say it again. Do you see what I see? Fishing for lost sheep in 2020. Yeah, that's our job description. <clears throat> Look at the restraint they had. Remember the showdown with the wizards? They must wait. They must wait on Yahushua. We must wait and learn to wait. Check out the similarities in application. Check out these sim similarities in application. The first wheel. Moses and Aaron being cast out of Egypt with the brothers on that day, the 15th. They were cast out. Second wheel of interpretation. What was it like then? How about the Messiah? What's going on with baby Yahusha? In Matthew 2.15, even Yahusha was called out of Egypt. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Matthew 2.15. How about the third wheel in application, folks? Our day, right now, at the Mount. We're at the Mount. We're in a rehearsal. We're not going to have a golden calf. We're taking the land. Now, back to the desert floor with the family team tracking and trucking into Egypt with empowerment that comes on them. A wife, two bros, a baby boy in covenant, kicking Pharaoh's coon dog. Stay humble. Stay contrite. 1 Corinthians 13, all the way. As gems of light of historical application comes forth, we see that Sukkot, we see that Sukkot in real life was a military camp layout. It was laid out, and it, there was a city of people there that, that were Egyptian, and they lived there. Get this. Sukkot was 25 miles from Goshen. They walked 25 miles in their first night. And do you think they got any sleep on the 14th as they did the Passover lamb? They anointed the post of the front door. They cooked the lamb, and they made sure there was nothing left of it by morning, and then they get on the desert floor. They traveled the desert floor probably going three miles an hour, maybe four miles an hour to get there at night. Sometime, sometime at night, possibly a 10-hour walk or less. Sukkot is a, an Egyptian military base. There's no record of it any place in Scripture. But Moses puts the camps there in their order. Then it hits me. They just left Egypt, and all the Egyptian firstborn are dead. And if the guards are there... They're going to let Moses and his people go. They've got orders from, from Pharaoh. <clears throat> they're going to stay there, and they're going to get refreshed, and Moses is going to put them in their tribes and organize them for the hall. 
This was a place to get ready for the trip. Remember, this is the 15th day of the first month. They have to go into the land for three days to hold a feast to Yahweh. And remember, <clears throat> it was the self-same day. Abraham, the promise, remember the covenant in Exodus 12? And a cool little gem. They took the bones with them. They took jo Joseph's bones with them. What last day application can we get from Abba? Well, just a thought to Midrash would be that it's a shadow picture of going into the Canaan land with the living at that time. The dead will rise in Christ. Last day application, the living and the dead. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Revelations chapter 12 and some history that we don't talk about too much. It's been swept underneath the carpet. In the sky, there is a shadow picture given every feast in the Maseroth. In this particular picture, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. I believe this was 2018. It was a reenactment of the Bethlehem Star. But in this particular picture, the woman is standing on the moon. And I just thought that that was really, really important. And if you do a word search on the woman standing on the moon, you will see why it's so exciting to behold this. In the Maseroth, every feast has shadow pictures to behold. This year, during Passover, the, um, the signs were in Gedi and, and, and um, Shaur, the bull, completely different constellation, but when we look up to the heavens, there's things to behold. The Maseroth shows us three applications, because I'll bet you when they were leaving Egypt, something was going on in the sky. And there appeared a great wonder. We're going to Revelation chapter 12, 1 right now. And there appeared a great wonder in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of twelve stars. And the woman fled into the wilderness, just like the children of Israel. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of Yahuwah, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nursed for a times, time, and half a time from the face of the serpent. These are historical applications that have to do with end time results on our watch. In Daniel 7, it was, it was literal years, 1,260 years. But in Daniel 12, a time and times and half a time is going to be 360 days, a time is one year, a times is a year and a half, a half a times is a half a year, making 1,260 days. More will be revealed as we study and follow the footsteps of Yahusha and beholding the 70 weeks as we study calendar more. Back to Revelation 12:16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yahweh and have the testimony of Yahusha. I'm showing you a picture here of a church from the early centuries in Italy and Rome. <clears throat> this is a second application in world history I want to show you. In the 1260 years of the Dark Ages, the, 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 the Catholic supremacy, the papal supremacy, the Roman Catholic Church was running the show. At least they were trying to. And there was a group of people called the Waldensians that stood up against Rome during this whole time, just like we're going to, folks. The shadow pictures with this particular group of people in the Dark Ages is huge for us to ponder because it is truly the second application of the wheel and the wheel and the wheel of us being put into the wilderness. This is the Waldensian church. <clears throat> the candle that you see 
represents the Waldensian church, and the light is from the Bible. Do you see the Bible underneath the candle? Do you see the seven stars around the light of the candle? Those seven stars represent the seven mountains in the Waldensian mountains in Italy. You see the words lux lucid in tenebris? Listen to this. These people are bold. And if you was to go to Europe right now, this church still stands in their face as a memorial of what we're going to do. Lux means the light. L-V-X, the light. L-V-C-E-T, levisit, I think that's how you pronounce it, means to shine. Tenebrous means darkness. You've got the light that shines in darkness. The Waldensian Church continued to teach the truth during the dark ages of the 1260-year reign. There's a 1260-day reign coming on our watch, folks. Stay tuned. It's right around the corner, and we're watching for the shadow. These similarities of what these people went through, I highly recommend that you study and investigate. You're going to be floored because history has been buried underneath the rug. They studied, and I bet 1 Corinthians 10, they knew the Old Testament. These people knew the Old Testament. Could you just imagine them living during the time of Daniel 7, during the time of the 1,260 years of the Dark Ages, and they knew? It's unbelievable what this church did. The Israel of the Alps. If you guys want to write this down, this is a two-volume text that gives a complete in-depth study of the Waldensians, including their origin, manners, customs, religions, organizations, and sufferings. This is history you want to investigate. The Israel of the Alps, a complete history of the Waldensians. Among the mountain solitudes in northern Italy, a people that exiled in the wilderness... They kept the light burning all through the Middle Ages, folks, during the Dark Ages, giving the word to their trust. They were a constant witness during the 1260 years of the Roman, Roman persecutions. They moved to the mountains to get out of Egypt's snares, the Pope, and all the pedophiles in the Roman pontiff, the Ashkenazis. They knew his law, the foundation of heaven and earth. You know, I want to show you this picture right here, if it comes up. I hope you see it. This is one of their homes that they built in the mountains. This is what we're supposed to be doing right now, folks. Getting out of the cities, getting out of the countries, and getting out of the city, moving into the country, and building homes. This home was built way back in the early days. I'm not sure when, but this is what they lived in. Kind of remarkable, huh? They knew his law, the foundation of heaven and earth. In every age, the Father has had his Bible-believing people. They knew the Pope was the Antichrist. These Waldensians held truth, and they believed in the Sabbath. They kept the feast days. They kept the feast days, and they kept the seventh-day Sabbath. They were branded as heretics over the time of the papal persecution. They were slowly killed off through the years, and their children used to memorize books of the Bible. And they would go down to the towns below and, 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 and disguise themselves as coal porters and tinkers, selling pots and pans and looking for, for people to share the word of God to. Through all hell and burning of the word, they stayed firm and they held truth for the generations to come. Please investigate this time in history, for I believe that, that the 1260-day rule of the papacy is a direct fulfillment of Revelation chapter 12. Please look into this, the time of history that has been so swept underneath the rug. Okay, in review to Campsite 1, Campsite 1 means... Meaning is a place of transition, a gathering of the exiles. Remember, Moses gathered the tribes in their order and used the military base to do just that, gathering the bros and coming out of darkness into the light. Another, another shadow picture was, was Moses and the crew 
traveled 25 miles in their first beeline to make a feast in three days. Remember, they were counting, and with them was the third wheel of their application. The power of the family unit and their role in 2020, while we hover at Camp 11 <clears throat> until the sanctuary is cleansed. That's us, folks. Yahweh gave them great protection while leading them through Egypt as they were leaving Egypt. It builds faith as we step out and get molded to be Joseph's flame. And remember, they walked out on the 15th day. It was the self-same day. That shadow picture with Abraham, remember? Genesis 12. And the Maseroth. Oh, the Maseroth. Showing us things to come as we rehearse the feast days. That was then what's going on today. And remember the books of Ezekiel pounding on us, the Easter egg and bunny rabbit? He's going down, folks. Shall we call it Edom? I hope this presentation made sense. Um, I've learned that this particular uh, teaching can be done so well, and I would like to sit down sometime when I have time to really do a thorough, thorough investigation on the campsites and make this a really wonderful presentation, even better to behold. Right now, I'm learning, and I've shared some morsels with you, and now we're going to be going to campsite two. Thank you for listening. Hey, thank you so much, Danan. That was really enjoyable. Enjoyed all those pictures and, you, and your passion. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to transition now to campsite two. Uh, over to Eric. Campsite two is called Ethan. And the theme of it is coming, uh, coming out from them, among them. And basically, as in campsite two, and they departed from Sukkoth and pitched in Ethan, which is in the edge of the wilderness, Numbers 33.6. Ethan, one of the things that it means is contemplation. This is where they had to sit and think about making some choices, some decisions, and this is where they were uh, having things going on in their minds, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But one of the things that I want to uh, talk about besides contemplation is that what it also means is from them, and it also can mean plowshares, and we'll go over this. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is um, Egypt. Not only was Egypt a physical place, but it was a scriptural symbol of spiritual darkness. Being in Egypt in a spiritual sense represents our lost condition, total bondage with no, no hope whatsoever. But I also uh, want to bring up Babylon. And I put on a little question there. Wait a minute. <laughs> We're at Etham. What are we talking about Babylon for? Yes, we are at Etham. However, we need to take a look at Babylon. Babylon. Egypt was not only the place mentioned in Scripture with a dual application. Babylon is the birthplace of sun worship, signifies the spiritual realm of pseudo-religion and false worship. Abram was ca called out of Ur. Then Abraham to journey to Canaan, and it talks about that in Hebrews 1, uh, 11, 8 through 10. The story of deliverance would not be complete without noting the spiritual call to come out of Babylon. So I wanted to make sure that those two were uh, put together only because in today, we, we look at 18, Revelation 18, 1 through 4, and we find the prophecy of Yahuwah's end time people, where we are now and what Daniel was talking about. We'll be called to come out of spiritual Babylon. And the warning to leave the borders of Egypt meld together in the end time message of Yisrael's uh, second campsite. So I want to make it clear because some of us have never been in a religion or never belonged to a denomination that I've met that have never even been. They were just called out by the Father. So they were completely lost. So they, they may have been in Egypt. But a lot of us here tonight, we all came out of religion and denominations. And so we, we basically are coming out of Babylon. 
which is uh, the prophecy that we're talking about now out of Revelation. So on the eastern edge of the Sinai Peninsula, near the Red Sea's eastern arm called the Gulf of Aqaba, we find the second camping spot of Etham, at Etham. As mentioned above, the name Etham meant contemplation from them and plowshares. They were out of Egypt proper, but not all of out of Egypt influence. In other words, although they were out of Egypt, Egypt was not out of them. Have you ever made a serious decision that you believed Yahuwah had directed you to make only to have his voice grow silent after you had made it, and then you were not sure? In the stillness, did you begin to question your sanity? your sincerity, or your ability to distinguish the voice of Abba Yahweh. Most of us must have felt like the children of Yisrael felt that the second campsite in this vast emptiness, just as the name indicates, the children of Yisrael contemplated what were some of those thoughts. You might want to think about some of those thoughts even in today, but you know, some of them, I would say probably a small, based on the scripture, uh, a, s a small percentage probably remembered what, how they'd been delivered and the miracles that Yah had brought them through and, and following the pillar, the clouds, the, the redemption, the, the rescuing of Pharaoh and drowning Pharaoh's army and the song of Moses. But then a lot of them are probably wondering, what in the world are we doing out here? And why are we going to make this long travel? And why don't we just head straight to Canaan? Why are we going to Mount Sinai? I mean, there's a lot of things here. There were a lot of different people contemplating. Just like I think today, and today when you think about this, I think a lot of people, especially in Babylon, in a denomination or in, lost in, in religion, and not really having a true relationship with Yahuwah and Yahushua, I think one of the things is, well, wait a minute, didn't I walk down the aisle, say a little prayer, and get baptized? That's all I need to do. What else, is, what else do I need to do? Why can't I just go straight to heaven? You know, why, why do I have to learn how to do this stuff? Why do I have to give up my football? Why do I have to give this up? Why do I have to give that up? You know, really? Is Sunday church really going to be an hour and a half long? They're not even contemplating the Sabbath. So it's, there's just a lot there. I, I think we have a lot in common today than they did back in that day. So I want to skip over real quick to Etham as the meaning from, from them. It reminds us of another parallel to our spiritual experience in this journey. It is in this meaning that we call to come out of Egypt and Babylon unite. We are told to, in 2 Corinthians 6.17, Come out from among them, and ye be separate, says Yahweh. And that's what we're told to do. And I, I know that we could have um, stuck with the Tanakh and, and also the Torah, but I wanted to give some of these a, a, a New Testament or a Brit Hadashah uh, meaning so people can say, well, that was the old one. Well, what, what does it say in the New Testament? So I'm giving you a second Corinthian scripture here to look at. In Revelation 18.4, it says, Come out of her, my people. Do not partake her sins, so not to receive her plagues. In Yermiyahu, or Jeremiah 51.6, Flee out of the midst of Babylon, and let each one save his life. Do not be cut off in her crookedness, for this is the time of the vengeance of Yahuwah, the recompense he is repaying her. So to come out of Babylon or Egypt means to come away from darkness, polytheism, engulfing the religion, religious world today, so that we might serve one true Elohim of creation. It means to shun idolatry immorality, and all would separate us from the kingdom of Elohim. What do you think Abba Yahweh 
is wanting at this point. Yahweh isn't just calling his people to casually come out of spiritual Egypt and Babylon. Pretty please, I love you. I gave my only son for you. I wish you would come. Please come and worship me. Oh, please. And I'm being a little facetious, and I apologize for that. But I, I'm just trying to make a point, because a lot of people would have you interpret his words as he's almost begging or trying to persuade us in a way and not realizing that, yes, he loves us. And yes, if you read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter, he, of course he loves us. And John 3, 16, of course he loves us. But he's not begging us because his word stands on its own. And when his word stands, he's already made his decisions. It's all been put in writing. And yes, the Ruach HaKodesh does draw us, and it draws us to Yahushua, and Yahushua points us to the Father. That's all true. But I don't believe that he's a father that is pretty please, and please come. I think he gives us commands and says, come out of there. You're my people. If you truly want a relationship with me, and you want to be part of the kingdom, come out and separate yourself. Make a decision. So I really believe that that's, that's something that it's probably more that direction than it is for uh, have, having a, big, a begging and pleasing God that some people like to be appeased by. So um, Yahweh, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got, I got a little animated there, but I, I said that in the next sentence. No! He is calling us to flee from it. <laughs> or as we say in the military, what part of flee don't you understand, son? You know, in order to flee from these forms of spiritual darkness, we must have our spiritual eyesight firmly fixed upon the prize of Canaan. Only when we are focused on the heavenly goal will we have the motivation to flee from all that would deny us its attainment. And we do want to attain that, like Danim was saying earlier. The goal is Canaan. It's that heavenly Yerushalayim. If we would attain heavenly Canaan, our gaze must be so focused upon realizing that eternal destiny that we cannot be entrapped by the enemy's enchantments. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. And I didn't want to take the time to read all these scriptures and this when I first started, but at the top of these pages is my name, my phone number, excuse the parentheses there, um, my email, my new email address, uh, because if you want this sheet, I can always email it to you if you want to email me. So when, when, when they were talking about this flee, flee from what? In Galatians, Shaul enumerates the characteristics of the ones who will not make it through the testing wilderness. Because that's where we are right now. We're in that testing wilderness. We're in the campsite. Uh, we don't know. Some of us are moved along to the other campsites. Some of us are just coming into campsite one. Some of us right now are contemplating. We're in campsite two. We're, we're brand new. We're, we got here. We, we were making decisions in our life who we're going to serve and how we're going to serve. And, um, and we're learning. And we have mentors to help us. We have people to help us along the way. But Shaul makes it very clear, and, and a lot of the Brit Hadashah does, even though what they're doing is they're quoting the Torah, they're quoting the Tanakh, they're quoting the prophets when they do this. And this is all in the Torah. But I went ahead and I made a list. Um, it, if you look throughout Galatians, it talks about this list. And as Galatians 5.21, at the very end of the Galatians book, um, they that do such things, and I want to emphasize this, shall not inherit the kingdom of Yahuwah. As follows, a list of attitudes and behaviors come out of 
to separate from was just what ancient Yisrael was having to contemplate then. Were they going to give up their idols? Were they going to give up their beliefs that they had learned the things, all the things that they learned in Egypt? The following characteristics remain in evidence then of still in Egypt and still having Egypt in us. So I put down a list of, and these are all have the strong concordance of what, what the numbers are. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through each, each one. I will, I will stop on a couple that I think are very, they're all very important, don't get me wrong. But there are some that we are uh, e more easily set, you know, and deceived about than others. Because I think a lot of us know that if we just paid attention to the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, and guarded those, we have we we know we're not going to go out and murder people and things like that. But there's some other slippery slopes that we can go down. But the first one is adultery, and we all know also that this doesn't mean marital unfaithfulness. But we're talking about adultery to the father, because when we decide that we're going to do something different, other than and guard his words, guard his commandments, his ordinance and statutes, we're committing spiritual adultery. So that's just as bad as committing uh, physical adultery on your, on your spouse. Fornication. Another um, definition of fornication is harlotry. And um, we don't want to be harlots. No, we don't want to be going out there and being whoremongers. So we, we, have, we have made a decision. We have contemplated that we are going to serve the creator of this universe. And so if we are going to follow Yahushua after the order of Melchizedek, these are things that should not even, we should not even having to be deal with. But they are things that are out there. They are things from our past, possibly. Um, they are things that we have to deal with. So it's good to know what it is that we want to get out of our lives as, as we walk this path. Uncleanness, filth in a natural or physical sense, but also moral lewdness. Idolatry, Dana alluded to this, worship of self-interest, money, etc. The bottom line is with idolatry, if you're not just worshiping Yahuwah, if you're worshiping anything else, putting anything else above Yahuwah, you're committing idolatry, whether it's yourself, your children, your parents, your sports idols, your American idols, your America's Got Talent, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, your Hollywood, your movies, uh, whatever it is, that you are, when you put those things before the Creator, the Father, you are, you are, you are wanting to stay away from that. That's what got the children of Yisrael in so much trouble all the time. They're always worshiping other idols. Witchcraft, magic, sorcery, pharmacy. And I went ahead and included this. It probably won't say this, but it says in, in other scriptures, rebellion is like witchcraft. So there, I wanted to make sure that when, you have, when you're being rebellious or your children are being rebellious or whatever you see people being rebellious, it's like witchcraft. So keep that in mind as well. Hatred, having enmity or to be in opposition. Variance, contention, being argumentative. Sometimes we can fall into this very easily, being argumentative with our brothers and sisters and not being, and be, having contention, especially in the household because you don't want that going on in your own household. Emulation, making war on the good in another, uh, I'm sorry, making war on the good in another in an effort to diminish that person. And you see a lot of this going on and taking place because some people, again, this is kind of goes back to idolatry. Some people uh, kind of get prideful and they, they think they know everything and sometimes they feel like they have to diminish others in order to put themselves or lift themselves up, put themselves on a pedestal. Wrath, 
uh, under wrath, it's impetuous indignation and anger. Wrath is, uh, and of course, our, our um, Yahushua, he pointed out that even if you, and I'm getting ready to talk about, uh, you know, this also goes with hatred, that if you hate your brother, you've committed murder. So he raised the Torah to a new level. If you look upon a woman and lust after her, you've already committed the act of adultery. So even Yahushua himself raised the standards of some of these things that we have to either have dealt with in our lives and we have to repent of, or that, we, that things that may continue to haunt us or things that we've overcome, and now we should be called upon to help others to overcome these things. Uh, strife. Seeking one own advantage, taking bribes, being selfish, and corrupted. Strife, one of the things it says, and I didn't put the scripture down here, but uh, it's, it's one of uh, Shaul's writings, is um, with strife comes every evil work. It's like you're opening up your door, your front door of your home, and saying, hey, evil, hey, every evil work, come on in. So when you have strife in your household, when you have strife in your church, when you have family, when you have strife in the body, if we have strife in T4, if we have strife in Calendar Club, if we have strife in our fellowships, this is, this is calling in every evil work. And I, I only want to place this because this is something that I have personally seen over the several last several years. And I just know it's one of those easy things uh, to fall into. And along with strife and uh, what happens when you fall into strife, you also fall into um, getting Luke 17.1, or in Luke 17.1, where he's talking about how many times should we forgive, you know, seven times, you know, no, 777 to 7,000, how many, you know, and, and because we become offended. Strife uh, not only can beset us there, but with strife, we can then fall into one of the greatest things I think people fall into is, is being offended. And uh, I, I, did a, I did a teaching a long time ago, and I called that, uh, it, was, it was done by a person in the church, in the Sunday church, his name John Bevere. And um, if you ever want to look at it, it's called the bait of Satan. And it talks about the bait of Satan is offense. And this is where I think that in the kingdom, we need to become military snipers. And we need to be, have our, our rifles, our long-range rifles out, and with a scope, be able with precision to see strife and to see a fence coming from a mile away and pick it off before it even gets close to us. Because when we get offended, that's what brings in bitterness and other problems. And one of the hardest things to get rid of as we grow older and we never take care of repenting and overcoming things is that root of bitterness. And that bitterness is only cemented inside of us because of strife and offense. So don't take the bait of Satan. It says it in Luke 17, 1, and I memorized this because I, this meant so much to me, that it is impossible. It is impossible that offense will not come. So just know that around every corner is offense. My wife used to say when she used to teach the word that I don't care if you knock me down, climb on top of me, and saying, this is personal. I'm personally telling you that I don't like you, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. That, and, and call me a dozen names. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to take it personal. That I am not going to receive it, and I'm not going to get offended, and I'm not going to get into strife because we can get offended very easily. It's a very easy trap to fall into. I really wanted to really do that because we become selfish, we become offensive.
So sedition's the next word, separating as faction, bringing division. You know, one of the things that in, in the scriptures it says, he, he wrote down several things that he hates, but he actually said there's a person he hates. The person that Yahuwah hates is the one who sows division amongst the brethren. I don't think I want Yahuwah hating me. You just need to say law about that a little bit. So I, I wanted to include that one for sure. So, um, so anyway, we get to sedition, bringing division. And then you have heresies, a form of worshiper theories that break away from truth. I'm not even going to go into this because I could some things and we'd have all kinds of people falling into that trap of the bait of Satan, which is getting offended. So I won't want to do that. But you know, as well as I do, being here on Calendar Club, there are several things, several things that I could mention that could whip us right into this right away. So I won't even go there. Next one is envying. Personal pain at the sight or thought of another's success. You know, one of the things that we used to tell our daughters is what somebody else has, whether it's happiness, material things, a great job, what seems to be a great family, what seems to be a great life, just signed a $5 million contract to play in the NFL, whatever it is that you might look upon another person, everybody out there, it's not at your expense. The Father loves you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a way for you to travel. He's got a plan, a destiny for you. And what other people get and what you don't ever get is okay because it's not at your expense. You're not the Father's not taking anything away from you and giving it to somebody else. So don't be envious and don't try to lust after somebody else's success. Be happy for people that get a brand new home. Be happy for people that get a car. Be happy for people that go on a trip. You know, don't don't say, oh, I never get a trip. There's some of that murmuring, complaining. I didn't go there yet. But so murder, uh, again, we have uh, murder and slaughter, drunkenness. And drunkenness, even though it talks about strong drink and it's basically what, what I, when I look at drunkenness, I see that in a bigger picture as an excess of just compulsions and addictions. And there are many addictions, there are many compulsions, and it's almost like a drunkenness that when you, when you allow the darkness or when you allow these things to revisit you, or if you haven't taken care of them properly and they haunt you, if you have not been delivered from them, if the water, uh, if the washing of the word, the water of the word, if the repentance and things haven't come and these things come at you, you'll notice that people will get delivered from alcoholism, for instance, or drug addiction, and then uh, they go along for several years, and man, they just fall completely off the wagon and go on a stupor for weeks at a time. I've seen it happen before. Um, and so you know that those are just, so when, when you think about drunkenness, just don't think about alcohol or drugs, but think about the things because we're all, we're all built differently and we all, Satan knows what our weaknesses are and we don't want to give him an advantage. So if you know what a compulsion or an addiction that you have, just simply stay away from those things that would even draw you near to those things. Don't even watch it. Don't even go near it. Don't even click on the, on the website out of curiosity. Don't do anything like that at all. Um, reveling. Ungodly feasting and impurity. Immoral partying. I'm not even going to go there because hopefully that's not anybody here dealing with any of that. So anyway, so I just thought that um, this would be a good Just know that this is all through Galatians and other parts, even in the Torah, 
These are all things that the Father has said. You're not going to be in my kingdom. If these are, if these are the things that you're practicing, and, and one of the other things before we get to the next area is that I, I tell people that, you know, meditate. He says, meditate on my word day and night. Meditate on the things. Think of things that are lovely, that are true in Philippians. Um, and a lot of people say, how do you meditate on these things? Well, you have to meditate on something. Because if you're, med if you're not meditating on these kinds of things, then that means you're meditating on the things that you shouldn't be meditating on. That you're, that you're complaining, you're grumbling, somebody's just offended you, you're thinking about something else. All oh, the whole list I just went over, you you're must be meditating on one of those things. So what happens is one of the ways that people get hoodwinked by the enemy to go back to these things these, and visit these places, I call these the, the campsites of, the, of es Satan. you know. These are his campsites. And in order to stay away from them, don't allow yourself to meditate on those things that would try to revisit you. And if you do get delivered from any of these things, please fill that void with the scriptures with the commandments, with the statutes, with the, with the ordinances, with, with the feasts, with, with praising him and filling your heart full of the things that would replace the things that you repented. Because we all know what happens. Those things go out in the dry lands. And if you haven't filled up your temple with the things of the Father, then those spirits can come back and they're going to bring seven more that are even worse. So we don't want to fall prey to those, the tricks of, of Satan at all. So going on, when we truly love and trust the Heavenly Father, we will delight to do His will, for His lovely characteristics will be written upon our hearts, according to Psalms 48. Remember, Walking under the blood symbolizes Yahuwah's part. But walking into the wilderness eight days with unleavened bread symbolizes our part in getting sin out of the life. Both are accomplished by his effort with the cooperation of our will. When we love, we love to honor. When we cannot or do not know how to love, we distort love into permissiveness toward the corrupting attitudes from the Galatians list. One of the things that I learned a long time ago, and again, this kind of comes back a little bit to meditation. What happens is we all grew up with certain behaviors, characteristics, things that we inherited from our fathers, generational curses, all kinds of things. So we've had to overcome characteristics, behaviors, and attitudes. Some of us grew up in the childhoods where we all have different testimonies, of course, but a lot of us grew up in families that were where there were verbal abuse, there was sexual abuse, there was there was separation, there was divorce, there was an abusive uh, both parents being abusive to one another. There were uh, alcoholism. There was all kinds of things. And, of course, those are things that we learned as, a, as children growing up. And some of those things may have been buried deep with, from within us that we've not still to this point in our life have not dealt with. So a lot of us don't know how to love. Uh, I know I'm one of those people. It was very hard for many years to become uh, intimate, to understand what intimacy really was. Because uh, with the type of parents that I grew up with, my father especially, uh, there, was, um, there was a lot of me being passive aggressive because he was a very violent, uh, abusive person. It was better to be passive, uh, my mom trying to protect us. So we learned how to be passive aggressive. Well, when you're passive aggressive and you learn not to confront and you learn just to put up with it, then that means that you, 
you have some behaviors that'll happen. Like for instance, you might put up with something for a while, but you might have a line in the sand that might get crossed and you might just blow up like a nuclear explosion. And you might do something that could wreak, wreak uh, havoc in your life. Uh, you might hurt somebody. You might, you might do something wrong, you know. Or you just may wind up destroying yourself because you might get into a compulsive or behavior where you are committing sins that are against yourself that you will wind up destroying yourself. So there are many types of things when, it, when you go down and you start studying this area. Behaviors reveal attitudes, and attitudes reveal character. And ultimately, our characters, which are made up of our thoughts and feelings, are root out attitudes and their resulting behaviors. And that's why it says in Matthew 7.20, by their fruits you shall know them. And the thing is, is if you meditate on these good things, on the, on the scriptures, like what we're doing, I'm, I've been so blessed to read the, the Psalms readings every day on the Counting of Omer. Today, uh, yesterday I was talking to Tim and Charlene and, uh, and Jeanette and talking to them how blessed I was, especially with yesterday's Omer count. But then again today, he turns around and shows me more in today's count and reading the scriptures that were today. And I've been so blessed to go through this uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and now the Omer counting on our way to Shavuot with this group of people. It's been an honor for me to do it because I've learned so much from so many of you, so many people. Uh, this has been the best ever. I've been to ones before, but I had no idea what I was doing, and I didn't know what it meant because we didn't have teachers teaching us what I've learned here. And for that, I'm grateful to the Father because I'm really expecting some good things when we get to the end of this count. And I thank Calendar Club for showing me how important this calendar truly is because it's, you know, when you pursue truth, and you pursue the Father, he really does take the scales and he takes the veils, the multiple onion skin layers off, and he really reveals things to you. I'm getting things revealed to me on a daily basis that I can't even imagine, and I wish I could share them. There's just not enough time uh, in the day to share them. There was so much just out of campsite too that I wanted to talk about. But I, I'm gonna uh, summarize here pretty soon because I don't want to keep people too long. But, um, but I just want to say thank you uh, to Tim, Charlene, Jeanette, and Richard, and all of you who've been studying calendar. Uh, for Mario, his, uh, for Danon, for bringing calendar to T4. Uh, you know, if I hadn't come to T4, I wouldn't have found out about calendar. Um, and even someone like Jim Staley, if I hadn't watched Jim Staley and saw Matthew Nolan, I would have known about T4, I would have never known about Calendar Club. So I, I, I thank the Father for all the things, all the little stepping stones. And as I continued to pursue him, he would just open up little doors and I would walk through them. Well, now we're walking in Campsite 2 and we're contemplating, but I have to warn you about something because I believe, I believe that I, even though I'm teaching on Campsite 2, I believe the Father is showing me that I've advanced to other campsites because I read ahead to some of the other campsites anyway. And I believe that I've advanced to some other campsites. And I think when, you, when we get to those, if you read about the other campsites, I think you'll see that you may, uh, a, a large part of your walks, you've probably advanced as well. But I have to tell you, I don't think, I think campsite two is always with us. Because even though I've been on this walk for a little while and my eyes were opened, um, losing my wife in December and being in the, in the situation I am now and being in the same situation a lot of you are in right now with this virus and being shut down and a lot of you not being employed, some of you are blessed to be employed. Some of you are blessed to be receiving funds. And I am, oh, I praise Yahweh for you. 
And I'm so glad. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you are blessed to have those things. But see, right now, I'm in campsite two all over again when it comes to contemplating what my future is, which is actually what is leading me to the next phase of campsite two, what we're going to talk about a little bit. And that is what I see happening around me with other brothers and sisters. So let me go ahead and um, wind this part up here real quick. But, um, but I, want to, I want to stress again that behaviors and attitudes and your character is all about what you meditate on. And if you're meditating and pursuing truth in the scriptures, you are on the right track. And the Father will take care of everything else. He will purge all the other things out of you. Um, Etham also means wholeness or perfection. The perfection is, um, is the Etham experience. Is that completeness of surrender that comes through deprivation and suffering. The children of Yeshorel challenge at Etham was to be complete in the resolve and come out. The children of Israel coming out of Egypt, going to campsite one, you can already see, and as they got to campsite two, and what you're going to see when they go to the other campsites is the murmuring and the complaining. So the easiest, all they had to do, and I say all as though I've been there, done that, which I haven't. But all they had to do, the Father showed them all of these things. And all they had to do was trust. They just needed to be trust. They just needed to obey. And because the Father already knew their future, he wasn't going to rush them to Canaan. He needed to bring them to Mount Sinai. He needed to show them. He needed to test them. He needed to reveal himself. Because remember, if you go all the way back to Genesis 1, in Genesis 1, and make your way through the Exodus, oh, we got a little bit of noise there? Okay. So, uh, in uh, Genesis 1, he was Elohim. Remember, he was Elohim. And then he reveals to Mo Moshe, Mount Sinai, tell the people, I am who I am. You know, and now in the campsites, he's revealing himself as a loving, caring father, Abba Yahweh, who's going to take care of us. He's getting ready to make a covenant with us. He wants to teach us. He wants us to walk in his ways. He wants to teach us, but he wants us to obey him. You know, it's, it, he, so he has to test us, and he has to see. Are we going to be obedient, and are we going to do what he asks? And we're going to talk about those things here in the near future. But it's, you know, it's like the old song they used to say, trust in a way because there's no other way to be happy in Yeshua but to trust and obey. So the reason I bring that up is because Again, I want, to, I want to bring this forward because I want, us, I want us to live, and I could have put so much more, but trying to do this all in, in an hour or less is pretty tough. So I want to uh, summarize this by saying we're being challenged right now. We are, we are being challenged, like Dana said. There's not going to be any golden calves built with this group. I can be pretty sure of that. But unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of golden calves built in other places. And, and some people aren't even aware there's a golden calf. And that's sad. But I'm, I'm with Danan and I'm with all of you where we just want to hurry up and do everything that we need to do within our power and with the, with the, um, the tasks and the assignments that we're given to trust and obey. Now, I'm about to say some things that I say in love, and I'm not trying to stir anybody up or I don't want to be offensive, but I want to give some, I want to give some examples 
of some of the things that I'm seeing. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not to necessarily anybody here, but I know a lot of you people uh, come into contact, a lot of my brothers and sisters here, come into contact with other people that are out there and other fellowships and other groups, like Jesse, for instance, and, and other people that have other fellowship groups they go to. And again, I would say, uh, and Jesse does a marvelous job of this, in that he can be around other people who don't necessarily believe everything that he believes, but yet he doesn't get offended. And that's a great thing. And I would build all, I would encourage you and edify you and build all of you up in that do not allow the enemy to place in front of you bait. Do not be baited by the enemy to take the bait of offense and get mad at your brothers or sisters, whether they believe the same way you believe or not. Uh, pray for them. Lift them up. When somebody says, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I believe in this or I believe that or, you know, this is the way we should believe and I don't agree with you and blah, blah, blah. That's okay. If that's, what the, it's that, if that's their stand and they don't want to just discuss it and have a midrash or anything like that, then wish them well and, you know, give them, you know, peace and shalom and go on their way and pray for them. Because if you know that you're right, no matter what it is, I don't care if it's calendar, I don't care if it's the, the priesthood of Melchizedek, I don't care what it is. Um, if you're sure that what you know is what you know, and, and, you, and you can prove it by the scriptures, then you can stand your ground and just still love other people. But if you have a problem or if you have a problem trying to love others, then I encourage you really to speak to Yahuwah. And if you, if you had past problems like I used to, uh, being passive aggressive, and my wife was wonderful, 21 years of marriage, she was able to help deliver me from having a passive aggressive attitude and characteristics. And I got completely out of that. And I, I grew. I, I can't even tell you how much I have grown in the last 21 years just watching her walk in the word because she was a word person. And um, so I, I'm grateful that he has uh, redeemed me. I'm grateful that he has, he has helped me come out of a lot of those addictions and a lot of those things that we talked about earlier. And I am open to help any brother, sister. I prefer to help brothers. I don't mind helping sisters, but I'd rather have another sister with me or by, right beside me to help me because uh, sometimes it's not just a good to talk one-on-one -on -one just being a brother. But I would love, I do talk to, I do talk to sisters one-on-one -on, -one on the phone and stuff, but I'm talking about in person. So, um, so to talk and help because there are things in my past that I won't go over here necessarily, but I am like an open book and the Father knows my heart, and I can help walk people through and guide them through things. I'm not the deliverer. It's the Ruach. It's Yeshua. It's the spirit of the living Elohim that is the one that will deliver you. But I can help show you and give you examples of some of the things that I did and show you scriptures and show you how you can be delivered from some of these things if you ever want to seek my help or seek seek any kind of mentoring in those areas. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a pastor. I'm not any of those things. I'm here on the journey with you. So I will just put my arms around you, shoulder to shoulder, and walk with you side by side. And um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this because I'm pretty much done reading stuff like that. But I, I just... I wanted you to know that I was going to be here for any any of you. Uh, I'm here for any of you at all uh, to help. So uh, I'm I'm an open book, and you can you can ask me anything, and um, and I will not get offended. But I will tell you this one part of my life. I was in the military for eight years, held a very high clearance, 
And I get asked, because when people find out about my past, they want to ask me about all the stuff that's going on with Trump and the virus and QAnon and all these videos and all this stuff that's going on. I am not a political person. Uh, I am not for Trump. I'm not against Trump. I'm not for anybody in the government. The government is corrupt. They do not eat from the tree of life. They eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some eat at the good side, some eat at the bad side, and some eat all around. And so when people say, well, this Defense Department or this CIA person or this, that, or the other is saying this and that. And I have sent some of these videos out to warn people. When I have, when I have retweeted or I don't tweet, but when I've resent certain videos out, and some of you know because some of you on here right now have received some things, I only send those out to get you to think critically for yourself, that you don't necessarily just want to believe everything that comes to you. Because I will tell you, being in the military and having the, the high, one of the highest clearances you can get and seeing some of the things and working in Europe during the time that they were creating the euro dollar and that they were creating the, the World Health Organization was doing things. And, and I was over there with the World Bank and the Vatican and the, and the, non, uh, the non-GO offices, of NGO offices of the UN and all these global elitists over there in Switzerland where I was living, in Geneva, in London, I will tell you that it's been their aim since I've been there and being in the military that they've always wanted to bring this country down. So you cannot rely on any source that is put out there, I tell people, unless you were in the White House in a skiff, which is like a little dome of silence where Nobody else can hear what you're talking about. And Trump was telling you everything, and he was telling you the truth. Unless you knew exactly everything, we don't know what's really going on. We have absolutely no idea. But if we stay focused on the Father, and we stay focused on the campsites, and we stay focused on this walk, and the assignments and listening to that still small voice, then we will, and we're walking in our destiny, then it won't matter whose side is on whose side. We won't matter, is Trump really this or is Trump really that? You know, is he really going to deliver us from this heinous global elitist group? And is he really a patriot or is he really an elitist? Well, guess what? We're going to find out. It's only a matter of probably weeks, months, or maybe the next election. But it's coming soon. But I'm not going to sit around and wait and watch the news or sit around and watch Fox all day long or any of these other programs and and listen to all this blather going on when I want to listen to that still small voice saying, ask me what you should do. And don't worry about what they're doing because what they're doing has no bearing on what you're doing because I've got an assignment for you. I have a destiny. Trust me. Don't trust Trump. And I'm not saying that you're not supposed to pay attention to what's going on out there in a general sense. But I I would implore you. I would would beseech you, as Shaw would say, brethren and sisterin. (laughs) That's a word. I would beseech you that you would incline your ear to the Ruach Al-Kadesh and say, show me in calendar, show me in the Omer count, show me at Shavuot. Let that spirit that came through the temple and through through that, that, that upper room and blew upon those apostles and disciples that were there and gave them the ability to go out and speak with boldness. I say to you, brethren, be bold, because you should be praying for a supernatural boldness, because we're going to need it. We're going to need to be bold in these days, 
there are people looking. And if we're getting sent videos and we're calling other people and saying, I don't know what to do. Do you know what to do? What do you think Trump's going to do this? Do you think Trump's going to do that? Do you think you think the global elites really are in charge? Do you think Trump's really in charge? Is he the president or is is FEMA in charge? I don't care who's in charge because I know the father's in charge. That's who's in charge. So I beseech you to just trust and obey and pray that he would give you the kind of love that when Yeshua would look upon a person and it said his, he was filled with compassion, that's the kind of love that you want to be filled with. I want to be filled with love. I want to be filled with compassion. I want to be filled with the ability to reach out to someone and say, oh, how much the Father loves you. And really tell them what that really meant and to show them where they can go. But have a boldness about it. And not a boldness to be arrogant, like I know it all, but a boldness to say, I'm confident because I know what the, what the Spirit, the Ruach Kakodesh, has placed inside of me. And I can tell you that if you do these things, if you seek him, you will find him. If you draw near to him, he's going to draw near to you. That's all he's looking for. He's looking. He's searching for people who are going to stand and say, I'll do it. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm here for you. This is the vow and the oath that I took after my wife passed. Is I'm, I'm going to be 60 here in a couple of months. And I want the next years of my life, however many that's going to be, to be pursuing nothing but what he wants me to pursue. Go where he wants me to go. Do what he wants me to do. Go where he wants me to go. And speak in boldness and not be shaken. Because I know that if I'm ever confronted with a vaccine, if I'm ever confronted with something, and I know I'm the temple, I know that I'm not going to defile my temple. And I can stand there and boldly and say, no, thank you. And like somebody told me, I'll have an orange with me. And I'll say, here, I'll take that vaccine right here in that orange. And that person knows who she is. <laughs> Don't be that. So, you know, I just want to tell you people that all you, I, I love you guys, your family to me, you are real family. And I really love and appreciate all of you. And I want you to know that I'm here for you. And I asked the Father all this week and last week that I just wanted to hopefully edify, embolden you, and have the Father speak through me. And it's not about me, but it's about him and give him all the glory and the honor and the praise. And I hope that everything I have said to you tonight has done that. And I pray for you and I bless you. And may the Father bless you and keep you and make his, his face shine upon you because he truly is. So let's get out there and let's really walk out the Shema. Let us. Hear and obey. Let us Shema. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eric. Wow. Um, and and I'm hoping that everybody is starting to see um, what we can what we can glean from reviewing and being reminded of of the ancient Israelites' journey because there's so many similarities in our own. As soon as we were called out, we, we were not even called out with a whole huge family. Many of us came out by ourselves or, you know, or loved ones did not follow in the same way. And so it, it was challenging. It's not like, you know, you walked out with the 200,000 people, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, just I hope that we all can see, like we all have a journey and you can probably see already where we're going with this 
and how we reflect on our own journey and what we've learned. And I think these lessons are not just our journey since we started or when we were called and when we were first baptized, but we're always retested and retested as we grow. If you think you've passed the test, <laughs> you think you look back and you've done well and, and you did good at something, beware because you'll be tested at a new level. And, and Yahuwah cannot move you forward until you pass a test. He'll keep moving you around and round and round that mountain. You'll keep getting the same challenges in your face over and over and over, right? We can all attest to that, right? We've lived it. And you start to realize after a few years, it's like, okay, I better dig in on this one because I don't want to go around that mountain one more time on the same challenge, right? But we're always going to have challenges. And that is what this journey is all about. And um, I think we can also see that uh, it's not just our own personal journey that we're tested and that he's building the character in us. But I think we can already see that as the days of tribulation are here, that every one of these things, we're going to be retested again at the level of what's happening in our world around us. There's, there's things that none of us have faced, except that it's coming. You know, we're going to, all the challenges that are going to come with the world crumbling down around us. It's going to be new and different for every one of us. But it's, we have to pass those tests again, just like the Israelites. You know, our Canaan is waiting for us too, that promised land, the place where Yahushua went away to prepare for us. And that is our hope. 